Um, I want to introduce our luncheon speaker. He's a historian. He's a professor at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. And he's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. He won the Pulitzer for a book titled Washington's Crossing. He's spoken to the US New Zealand Council uh, on a couple of occasions. Uh, we consider him a, a true friend. He's written a book um, about open societies. Uh, this is his passion. He's working on a book about Africa right now. Uh, but he's focused on, on what it means to be an open society. And his, his book, uh, Fairness and Freedom, compares and contrasts the histories of the United States and New Zealand. Please join me in welcoming Professor David Hackett Fisher. It's a pleasure to be here, and, and uh, a special pleasure yesterday to meet with Barbara and to hear about her book that Bill just described. It's about the meeting of uh, Americans and New Zealanders 175 years ago. And it was a, it's a, it's a, a wonderful story, and uh, I, and and a, a great addition to 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 the to the literature. I also wanted to uh, say something about Bill. Uh, in all of the uh, acknowledgments and thanks that you've heard this morning, one name was missing, uh, and it was Bill Maroney. Uh, and Bill has been the driver of this event, and I think we're all very much in his debt. So I wanted to say thank you to Bill Maroney. <laughs> Uh, Bill asked me to talk about my uh, book. I'll begin by saying that uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to, to listen to all of you uh, here and to uh, hear your uh, exploration of, in many cases, I think the, the problems, the opportunities, the, the challenges that New Zealanders and Americans uh, share in common. What I want to talk about are uh, some things uh, that uh, that's, uh, that are, are different uh, uh, between uh, the, our two uh, nations. And I, I think that uh, these differences could be, in some ways, uh, very useful to us all. Uh, let me begin uh, to tell you a little bit about how the, the, my inquiries began. I'm of the oldest school of history, the school of Herodotus. Herodotus gave us the name history, in his Ionian Greek, it means inquiry. Uh, his book meant the inquiries of Herodotus. And for those of us who are of the school of Herodotus, that's the way our histories begin, too. Uh, we start with a question, as simple as we can make it, and straightforward. And then what we try to do is to move beyond that to the other issues that flow to the models, and, and maybe a theory or something of that sort. But we don't start with an ideology, we don't start with the historiography. We start with a simple question about what actually happened. Uh, and I, was, uh, I found myself in New Zealand without really ever intending to, 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 to go there. Uh, I had written a book that Bill mentioned called Albion Seed, and uh, a colleague of mine at Auckland University asked me to come down and talk about it. They, uh, uh, New Zealanders think that they are Albion's seed. Uh, it's 60 percent uh, report uh, British ancestors compared with 40 percent in Australia and about 20 percent in the United States. Uh, we're not sure about the United States because a good many Americans don't like to talk to the census taker about who their ancestors were, particularly in the southern backcountry uh, where they, they, they ask the census taker if he's in the process of making them into slaves of the IRS. And they're getting better about that. In the census of 1790, they actually shot census takers uh, in, the southern, in the southern mountains. So we think that, they, that's, that we know about the, where that population came from. So 20% is probably a little lower uh, for uh, uh, the United States in terms of the proportion who think they are of British ancestry. But it's a very, that's one difference between the United States and New Zealand. So I talked a bit in, uh, in Auckland about this, and then invitations came to five other New Zealand universities. And I was traveling with my wife, who is a botanist and a biologist, and we did what Americans love to do. We hired a car and hit the open road from one end of New Zealand uh, to another. Everybody talks about New Zealand as a small country, 
but it's not a country when you try to go uh, from the north to the south. It's, as, it's the distance is equal to the distance from mid-coast Maine to, mid to middle Florida. Uh, it's a bigger country than often uh, people uh, 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 think as they speak of it. And also very diverse. When, after we drove from one place to another, we, then we did what New Zealanders love to do and uh, went tramping in the bush, which was a special place for a, a botanist, uh, which, uh, which my wife is. And so we, we greatly enjoyed discovering uh, that. And, and as we traveled, we were wondering about the, the similarities and differences between New Zealand and the United States, um, the culture in particular. We kept finding uh, small differences, maybe trivial things of the language, but they added up to a pattern that was clearly non-trivial. Uh, and then we were on the road uh, on a wintry August day uh, from that, that wonderful place, Akaroa, uh, to Christ Church, where I was talking at Canterbury uh, University. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you've been to Akaroa, but there at the end of that peninsula, there is a small French village of that name that was planted in 1840 uh, as a, 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 an attempt to make New Zealand into a French dominion. Uh, and it's still very French in its character, and they increased and multiplied, and many New Zealanders have French ancestors as a consequence and e evidence of the diversity. Anyway, as we drove back up through the through, through, through two caldera uh, of that, uh, uh, that shape Banks Peninsula, uh, we found ourselves in the middle of a New Zealand election. It was a by-election. Uh, only one seat was at stake, but uh, the, uh, the, uh, the government of Prime Minister Bolger, who's here today, held power by only one vote in Parliament, and the loss of that seat would have, uh, would have brought down the government. And so the, the campaign was very hard fought, uh, and it was covered by the media in great abundance. Uh, and uh, we, uh, as we, we observed, that it, 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 the sites were very similar to an American election, but the sounds were strange. And we couldn't think why, my wife and I. We scratched our heads about that. And then suddenly it dawned on us that n very few of those New Zealand candidates, and there were a great many with the multiplication of parties, this the year was 1994. Uh, that, with that multiplication of parties, there were a great many uh, uh, vying, and uh, yet none of them seemed uh, deeply interested in discussing liberty and freedom. And those words, of course, are at the very center of American political discourse. I think that if American politicians were forbidden to mention the word liberty and freedom, a great silence would fall over this city. <laughs> Uh, but uh, and so we were struck by by that contrast, and we scratched our heads over that. That was a period when New Zealanders were were debating in, in with a kind of intensity uh, the restructuring uh, that had transformed many New Zealand institutions, and we wondered if that was typical of a moment in New in in, in New Zealand's uh, uh, history. But then the next year we were invited back. This time. Uh, to, to, to have a long, the first trip was only about a month, uh, then we were invited back to a term uh, at Otago, the oldest university in, uh, in New Zealand, in Dunedin. Uh, and there, there's a great library, which is called the Hawken Library. And it's a manuscript library. And the manuscripts go back to the beginning of, of, of British colonization. Uh, they include the, the travel journals uh, of Bishop Selwyn, and the founders of those early settlements that are, were called the, the Six Colonies of New Zealand. And all of that is, is there. And then beyond that, other things, treasures. Uh, one, I think, of the, of the most extraordinary works of New Zealand literature, which is the autobiography of a conservative a, a political leader named William Downey Stewart. It's never been published, but there it is in this historical happy hunting ground which is the Hawken Library. And as we looked into that material, just about all of the people we were reading around the year 1840 were deeply interested in fairness, justice, equity, used those words intensively. 
Uh, and uh, the farther we looked, the more we discovered that William Downey Stewart did the same thing. So we began to find evidence that this interest, and I would say even obsession, uh, with fairness and justice uh, went through every generation that we were able to study in the primary, in, in the, in, in the primary evidence. And this is very different from America, where uh, much of my work is done on, in early American history. And in the founders of Massachusetts, of Virginia, uh, William Penn in Pennsylvania, fairness, uh, freedom and liberty were very prominent from the very start. And we get a continuity in these two things. And how could that be so? Uh, where did it come from? Well, we've got a new tool, which are called Google Engrams. Many of you have probably used them. You can uh, uh, bring up Google, uh, the Google Ngram program on your computer. It's very user-friendly. Uh, and then you can put in a, enter a phrase or a word in almost any major modern uh, language uh, and, you, and, and uh, instruct the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Ngram system to generate a time series. And we could see that if we called up um, uh, one, there was one uh, uh, corpus of material. These are all the books that have been, uh, that have, have, have been put in, into a computer readable form by Google. Uh, one, of the corp one, of the, one corpus of English language books is so large that they can't even put a number on it. It's just called lots of books. <laughs> Another one is called one million English books, that is to say books published in England. And that's the one we used. And what we found was that if we typed in liberty and freedom, the frequency of usage uh, uh, surged in the period of the colonization of North America by English-speaking people. That is, in the period from the mid, early to mid 17th century up to a peak in the 1770s. And after that, the frequency of liberty and freedom has fallen off in the usage in, in England. And then I typed in fairness. And fairness was, it goes back as far as the, the evidence runs in its, in its usage, but its frequency was very low until a little bit after 1800. And then it really surged around 1840, which is the critical year for the founding of New Zealand by the English colonists. Uh, and uh, it has continued to grow ever since. But I think we found a clue in the culture of England, we are, in some sense, two countries that are divided by our different English origins. And they are different in their time. It's a question of timing. It worked other ways as well. We in America, the United States, uh, North, uh, North America, are the product of the first British Empire uh, that ran to about 1776 and, and came apart in the War of American Independence. New Zealand is a product of the second British Empire. And the values were very different in the people who were running those empires. And I've written about that at some length in, in my book. So that's one way of explaining uh, these differences that we were, uh, we, we were finding. One question is, um, what difference does that make? Uh, what, what, is it useful uh, in some way for the business that we have been transacting here? Uh, does it help us to understand or even to solve problems uh, that might be addressed with some of this historical material? And I think there are a lot of things that we can uh, learn and put to work in just that way. Uh, uh, one is that we can begin to look at the way in which these ideas of liberty and freedom and fairness were developed in these two countries. That is. After we were at Otago, I got another invitation, which was to go to the, what was then the newest university in New Zealand, which was Waikato University. And they have another great library. The, li the, the quality of research in New Zealand is just extraordinary uh, and makes some of these things possible. And in that library, the librarians had done something which doesn't happen very often. They collect what are called ephemera, and in this case, political ephemera, which included the manifestos, uh, the position papers, uh, the, the, all the documents, the emails that, were, that came out of New Zealand's political parties. And we were able to study them very uh, carefully that way, using that material, 
uh, and observing the values that were engaged in these documents. And in nearly all of them, fairness, justice, what they called natural justice, and one man who used that said you can basically think of natural justice as fairness. Uh, they, of those, that word appeared often in the title of these manifestos. Uh, and if not in the title, very prominent in, 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 in their substance. But what was interesting to me was that they were very different in their understanding of fairness. Uh, if they were parties to the left, they tended to link fairness to equality, to equity, the root of equity, which is in most modern European languages, is, is means straight, even, in some sense, uh, that way. And that's one version of what fairness might mean. If they are to the right, they tended to be linking fairness to an idea of the rights to one's own possessions, or to one's grandfather's possession, or whatever it may be. Uh, and then there were others as well who weighed in. Some of the most interesting discussions, one thing about Waikato is that it's a great center for Maori studies. It's in the center of the greatest density in the country of countryside of the Maori population. And when we got into that, we saw that Maori were in, in actively engaged in this great national debate in New Zealand. And they used fairness, uh, which they sometimes translated into their, uh, in, in, as tika, but often as a fair play or fair do or fair go, all those words that ring oddly in American ears, but are very common in New Zealand. But what they did was to use fairness as a kind of meta-ethic. That is, they were trying to um, argue for the coexistence of two very different ethics, a Maori ethic and the Pakaha ethic. A Pakaha, as you know, a, a, an ancient um, Maori word that I think was, has been translated as uh, uh, weird spirits with white skins. <laughs> Uh, and the, the European uh, settlers of New Zealand are, I believe, the only uh, settler society that knows themselves today by a name that Maori gave them. Uh, and the Maori um, used fairness and tika as an idea of a meta-ethic which could reconcile or allow to coexist two very different ethics. And I thought that was a very creative way of doing this. Everybody weighed into that great debate, and we found in the ephemera collection in Waikato uh, other things that came from a, an association of Christian denominations. I think the people who say that New Zealand is a, a highly secular society are, I think, right in some degree, but they've overdone it. And we found that religious groups were very active in this debate. And 12 of the leading religious groups came together to issue their own manifesto. They said, we're concerned in this new restructuring that things have not been done as fairly as they should be. And their definition of fairness was taken from Gospels and the, word of, of the words of Jesus. Uh, they, from the, that, that passage uh, that, where Jesus said, what ye do for the least of my brethren, ye do for me. And so they said the test of fairness in a society is the condition of the least advantaged members. And I thought that was a very interesting approach to this idea of fairness. And then there were others as well. There, was, uh, there, there were uh, some people followed uh, the American writer John Rawls, who argues has written that great book uh, on fairness, on justice as fairness, and fairness as an idea of justice to individuals. And it individuates the question of fairness. And then there was another a very interesting political party uh, called uh, New Zealand First, which made it a collective idea. It was an idea of common service to the nation, uh, led by a very uh, a complex figure, Winston Peters, in, uh, <laughs> in Australia. I will say no more about Winston Peters, except he's historiographically of high interest. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the, we kept, as we looked, we discovered that New Zealanders had given more uh, meanings to fairness than I had ever seen I, uh, 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 this way, and so highly creative. We even found the New Zealand Nazi Party. It was called the New Zealand NEO Party. And there was a manifesto by the party Fuhrer, 
who who explained he had a the cover was uh, had the much of the uh, of the Third Reich's uh, 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 imagery, uh, the Art Deco eagle, uh, and then uh, 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 there were the, underneath there was a circle which. Uh, in Germany had been filled with the swastika and that was removed and the circle was left open and the New Zealand Nazis explained that that open circle meant that they were in favor for open opportunity by Maori that is to say <laughs> in New Zealand even fascists had to align themselves uh, with this idea and tradition of fairness and the question arises if fairness can mean all of those things at once does it really mean anything in particular, and I think the answer is yes. That is to say, we, and we began to look for the common denominators of fairness. What we found, for, uh, uh, we found a number of things. I always look to the history of these words. Fairness is unique amongst our ethical terms uh, in, 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 in Western languages in that it's only to be found in a few Western languages before the mid 20th century. Only in English, in Frisian, in Danish are there cognates of the word fair or fairness. Uh, and uh, we find them there at a very early uh, date. Uh, and they come from a root that means to be content, to be content. And they were used in English as early as the track, the Venerable Bede was using the word fairness in its old spelling in 888 AD. And it was well established in these cultures but not in other languages. There was no word for fairness in German until after 1945, when German dictionaries began to include defairness. They brought the English word into German because there was no exact equivalent. The French had no word for, uh, for, for fairness. They were translated as, as juste, as just, uh, 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 in terms of justice, but that's a different thing. That's a word from as, the Latin root, for law, and it means true to some idea of law in that, in that way. But in the late 20th century, there was a new contribution to French soccer slang, which when the referee did something that the crowd did not like, they, they would shout, pas le fair play, much to the displeasure of the Académie Française. <laughs> and so we find that there's something, there's something really, and I'm wondering what, the, what this word fairness originally meant in its earliest usage, and to, to look for answers, we went back into the Norse sagas and places of that sort. And these, uh, uh, our ancestors, and many people in this room, these were, uh, this was a very rough crowd uh, and um, a, a predatory uh, a culture. And I think that fairness was introduced and had a social function to keep them from slaughtering each other to the extinction of the tribe. Uh, and then it, but it was a very tribal idea. It was not extended to people outside that circle of tribal males who would vote by cr clashing their spears on their, on, their, on, on, their, uh, on their shields. It didn't extend to people of other ethnic groups. It didn't extend to women who were also a very rough crowd in these, who ar armed themselves and many a uh, Viking who came home from his raids and tried to treat his wife like a conquered province, uh, did, met, the, met his end uh, in, in, just that, in just that way. And so I think fairness was a tribal idea, very limited in its reach, and yet very powerful in the way that it reconciled these things. And I think that what fairness meant there was that first of all, it was to describe uh, both procedural and substantive fairness and then also to describe um, a, 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 a fairness that um, was to regulate relations between people who were in competition or conflict in some way. And what it mostly meant was not taking undue advantage of another person. And I think that was the core meaning of fairness. And then the word fairness changed after Christianity, it became slowly more expansive, more universal. I think when we can see it at the beginning in New Zealand's history, it mainly was between Pākehā. And then it began to reach out more and more to Māori. Uh, and it has grown uh, ever since. And then in the 20th century, uh, there is now, there are many technical uh, uh, applications of fairness. 
in a large number of learned disciplines, the back of my book, I've got appendices on these extremely intricate meanings of fairness. But the more elaborate it becomes, the more it is the same thing. The more it means not taking advantage of other people, which might or might not mean equality. It overlaps with these things. It overlaps with equity and justice and fairness, like circles on a Venn diagram, but each one of these circles has its own center. Uh, and New Zealand has a very particular relationship uh, to, this, uh, to this idea. And one question is, does this idea of fairness have any relationship to the reality of life in New Zealand? Is New Zealand actually a fair society? And I think the answer is that the, the, the application of fairness always lags behind the idea. And when we talk to New Zealanders, as we did frequently, about fairness, uh, they would tell us that, uh, 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 that the country does have a deep concern for fairness, but it's not as fair as it used to be. Uh, and so that fairness becomes something that is continuously there are continuously attempts to enlarge and to expand it in those, uh, in, 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 those, uh, in those ways. And the same thing has happened to liberty and freedom. I've written another book called Liberty and Freedom about the multiple ideas of liberty. I don't have time to go into that here. Um, it's, it's summarized also in my book, uh, Fairness. Copies are out in the lobby. Is that right, Bill? Of, I think Bill has bought copies of my book for all of you. Uh, and uh, I, 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 there's, uh, there, uh, I'd be happy to sign them uh, after the dessert if, if anybody would, 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 would like to have that. But the reason I'm interested in this is because of my interest in open societies. And open societies were something that were, it was a phrase that was coined in Europe um, by, uh, by several people, uh, by the philosopher Bergson, uh, by others as, as, as well, who began, but Karl Popper, that wrote the biggest book on, uh, on open societies. Popper was an epistemologist, and he thought about open societies in epistemic terms. He said that a fair society is a society that, ex that expects and even requires its citizens uh, to think for themselves, to know for themselves. And it was an idea of knowing. Historians work with it in a different way, and we think of it in terms of the properties of the society itself, that is, uh, a, a politics of something like democracy, or an open market system, uh, it, it, the, uh, uh, the list of other things, the rule of law as, uh, as uh, most in, important. And we know that these societies understood that way, uh, began to grow at, at least as early as the 18th century kept growing in the 19th, early 20th, and then suddenly there was a terrible crisis from about uh, 1930 or so to 1940. In Europe, in 1930, there were about 25 open societies on the continent of Europe in 1930. By 1940, there were two, only two, survived, Sweden and Switzerland. And the others had been uh, destroyed and they become closed societies which were the opposite of all of those other things. And since that time, open societies have been expanding. But the more they expand, the more they challenge others. And with that challenge, uh, we have a problem and an opportunity that brings us together. Hillary Clinton gave a speech at Brasilia on April 17th, uh, 2012, about a little more than a year ago. And she said she was speaking not only for herself, but for her country, and she said, the United States believes that in the 21st century, the great divisions and the great questions will not be uh, between East and West, or North and South, or different religions, but will be between open and closed societies. And I think that is the business that we're in. And one way that we can strengthen these open societies is by studying their differences around the world. New Zealand can teach the world about fairness. America can teach the world about liberty and freedom. We can teach about the vices of fairness and the vices of freedom. What's the vice of liberty? It's the idea that one person has a liberty to take away another person's liberty. That's a vice of liberty. And we had a lot of trouble with that in this country. It nearly tore the country apart and it was very hard to put it back together again and to basically rule out 
the legitimacy of that idea. What's a vice of fairness? It's the idea of the tall poppy syndrome. Whenever I would talk in New Zealand, people would say, before you get too enthusiastic about fairness, think about the tall poppy syndrome, the idea that people who have exceptional gifts and talents should be cut down to size because exceptional gifts are unfair. And there's been, New Zealand's had a problem with that. I think they, that people are getting past that today. But we can lend each other our experience. We can learn from the fact that we are not, I say this to the young people in this room, delighted to see you here, but you are not the first people to walk this earth. Others have walked before you. Uh, and, and you. And you can learn from their experience just as you can learn from, the, from your own. And we can learn from the experience of both New Zealand and the United States. Thank you. Mm -mm. Okay.